This is Gareth Aiden, and it's my pleasure this morning to be taking the oral history of Bill Osier, a longtime friend of mine and high school classmate, and one of the uh, outstanding uh, commercial litigators in the Nashville Bar. Bill, good morning. Morning, Gareth. I think the best place to start is right at the beginning. Could you give us your full name and your birth date? William Nelson Osier, and I was born on December the 2nd, 1944. And I believe you've been a Nashville boy all the way through. All the way through, absolutely. Tell us about um, your mom and your dad, their names and um, what, they, what they did. My dad's uh, name was John, actually Johnny was his uh, given name, Johnny. Uh, Riddell Osier. Uh, he was born on a farm in South Alabama, uh, just south of Montgomery, actually in 1897. Uh, I was a child of a second, second marriage, so uh, uh, you know he saw lots of changes in the world over over his uh, career and lifetime. My mother uh, was Mildred Chumley, was her maiden name Osier, and her family, she was like a third generation Nashvilleian. I mean, she went to Tarbox School and Hume Fogg and. Uh, Grew up in Nashville, went to Peabody for a couple of years, and then went to work actually with my dad in his in his business. Uh, he was in the outdoor advertising business virtually most of his career. From the he moved to Nashville in the 20s, and uh, he became the manager of the General Outdoor Advertising Company plant here in Nashville, and then he bought his own company and operated it up until the late 60s when I decided I was not going to go into the family business and become a lawyer, and, and he sold it. So. Uh, and I have a sister, uh, Millie, uh, who was six years younger, and she lives here in Nashville as well. So, uh, and we have uh, married uh, Ann Lewis, uh, who Ann and I met at Vanderbilt. Uh, she was a cheerleader, and the first date we had, she was actually named the homecoming queen, which neither one of us do. <laughs> and, uh, it was sort of love at first sight. Uh, we started dating and uh, got married a year after I finished the first year of law school. So. Uh, well, that's a, that's a good summary. Uh, your dad, as I recall, was very successful in his business. He was, you know, and he was pretty amazing. Uh, as I said, he grew, he was born, his dad was a farmer. His father actually fought in the Civil War. He was drafted uh, when he was like 17 years old, right towards the end of the war, and was discharged in Greensboro, North Carolina after the war ended. But he lived through Reconstruction in South Alabama. And my dad, as I said, was born in 1897. The first presidential election he voted in was 1920, and he voted for Harding, who was a Republican. And his dad just about disowned him because Republican was a nasty word down in South Alabama. But uh, he actually, uh, he dropped out of school after the eighth grade. He had three siblings. His brother died when he was 10 years old. So he went to work to help support the, the family. And so he had no formal education at all. He was self-educated. Uh, he had an older aunt who lived in Montgomery, who he lived with for a while, who taught him manners. <laughs> and uh, then he, uh, but he used to say he always he was went through the College of Hard Knocks, and, uh, and he, you know, he learned to uh, finance and, and business things, and uh, did very well in the outdoor advertising business. And towards the end of his life, he branched out into other businesses. He bought the Dr. Pepper bottling plant here in Nashville, where I worked all through high school. And, in the summers, and he got wow. involved in the formation of Lynn Broadcasting Company, which you probably remember George I Carlton do. was involved in. And unfortunately, he got uh, connected up with the Hookers, and I'll touch on this later on in my early career. But uh, was involved in you know when they were forming Mini Pearl Chicken and Whale Inc. And both oh, of yes. were unsuccessful, yes. and uh, unfortunately cost him a lot of money towards the end of his life. But uh, but he did well up to that point. Where did you go to grade school, Bill? I started, we, uh, when, when I was born, my family, li they lived on a farm in Goodlettsville, which interestingly enough had belonged to the Bass family, uh, the same family as Mr. Mr. Bass, Jim Bass. And uh, w they moved into town when I was three or four years old over on Cedar Lanes, and I started at Stokes, the first grade, and then they moved over on Esteswood Drive right down the street from Harvard Hall in 1951, and so I moved over to Julia Green second grade and went through Julia Green to the eighth grade and then the MBA to high school. All my friends from Julia Green, or virtually all of them, went to Hillsborough, which is where I thought I would go, but 
my parents knew Dr. Sager from church, Westminster Presbyterian, and they said, oh, you're going to MBA. And uh, they said, you may not uh, do that well, scholarly-wise, but you can go over there and behave yourself. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you and I both had Dr. Sager. Yeah, we did have Dr. Sager, so I went to uh, MBA for four years and then, then on to Vanderbilt. Uh, Was it your mom or your dad that sort of pressed you about school? Or was it both? It was really both. You know, my dad obviously was envious of people who had education. I mean, since he was self-educated, and when he, you know, grew up in, in business-wise in Nashville in the '30s and '40s, uh, virtually all of the Nashville businesses were run by people who were Vanderbilt graduates, and he was always envious of them. And uh, he told me, he said, you know, if you're going to stay in Nashville, you need to go to Vanderbilt. <laughs> And um, you know when I, you know I could I guess could have gone anywhere uh, from high school, but you know when you and I both did well grade wise, and uh, I didn't even apply anywhere else. I applied for early admission to Vanderbilt and of course got in, and then uh, never regretted it a bit. But uh, well, you know I think that was true when we went through school that Vanderbilt was the place because it was a little bit Nashville centric, but I think it's changed. Yeah, it was definitely a southeastern oriented mm -hmm. school, and a lot of people from rural Tennessee and, and a lot of Nashvilleians. I mean, there were a bunch of folks from our class at MBA who, who came to Vanderbilt, went to Vanderbilt. So uh, yeah, it has changed considerably. It's very international now and diverse. Well, you were, in a way, the way I was. I was headed to West High School rather than MBA when my dad popped the news to me. <laughs> How did, tell us about your MBA experience and uh, did you, any problems getting adjusted and how you did. You know, I had some excellent teachers at Judy Green, so I was really well prepared for MBA. I had one teacher who I had both in the fourth grade and again in the eighth grade, named Miss Subtle, and she was terrific. Uh, she had a son who was a little bit older than my contemporaries were, but uh, he went to Hillsborough, and she sold world books in the summertime, and, but she was a terrific teacher. And I had some other teachers that were really good. We had a little principal who was like four and a half feet tall, maybe. Mrs. G.C. Mathis, and in our eighth grade year, she would come in and do a math class one day a week where everybody stood and she would ask questions, and if you didn't answer it immediately, you had to sit, you sat down and she moved to the next, and it was you know, almost like it, it was pressure, <laughs> which was good at training, and, but it made you think quickly, and it was a broad range of math type things. So I was well prepared, and uh, you know, we, you, we Supper through the first six weeks at MBA in the big uh, in the old gym, which was the study hall. And after the first six weeks, they I didn't know there was such thing as a privilege list, but found out I was on a privilege list, so we could leave study hall and go study wherever. So you know, we had some really really good teachers. I thought at MBA, Mr. Carter had just come like a year before and exactly. started to institute discipline that had not been been present at MBA very well, at least before then. And, and uh, you know. Played freshman football and JV football and JV basketball and maybe JV baseball and then you know we played football together for a couple of years at high school and uh, you know I did a lot of different things uh, you know I, we coach Owen named game captains for some reason our senior year and, and then we elected captains at the end of the year so you know I got elected captain of the football team I was the editor of the Bell Ringer this newspaper and you know did well scholastically and. Uh, so uh, it, it was a good experience and made a lot of good friends that we've maintained friendships up to today. I mean, uh, 60 years later, Charlie Ray, you, uh, Frank that, Wentworth. That's right, Charlie Ray was your, was your classmate and my classmate at MBA, and yeah. you both were at Bassberry. So yeah, we've ended up being together a long time. In fact, Charlie, it's interesting, when I decided to go to law school, I applied to Vanderbilt and I applied to Harvard. Charlie was at Amherst and he applied to Harvard and got in, I got in. And he called me and said, you need to come up here and go to Harvard with me. And uh, by that time, I was dating Ann pretty seriously. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get one of the first Patrick Wilson scholarships. So I decided to stay at Vanderbilt and not go to Boston. <laughs> so, yeah. But yeah, Char and then Charlie came back to Nashville. And he and I started at Bassbury and Sims at the same time. So. Uh, I, get, I take it there really not, never was a question that you were going to go to Vanderbilt in undergraduate school. Yeah, not really. I, that's kind of okay. made up my mind. That's where I wanted to go and because uh, I planned to live in Nashville. So uh, I took my dad's advice and you know, got, got the Vanderbilt degree. So. Tell us about your experience in undergraduate school at Vanderbilt. Well, it was, uh, it was similar to you know, my, my MBA experience. Uh, obviously, it was bigger, so I didn't do quite as many things. but. Uh, 
you know, it was a great experience. I had some teachers and a variety of subjects that I thought were really good, and I enjoyed one of them, one of them was your dad, who I was always one of my favorite professors at Vanderbilt. He was great. And uh, so I was an English major, which turned out, I think, to be a great major for, going, for being a lawyer, because so much of law work is written for being able to write well and express yourself is really important. But uh, he and Walter Sullivan, who in the English department was my advisor, who described himself as the last surviving Tory many times. Uh, I, for my uh, uh, science requirement, uh, you know, if, as you well remember, freshman chemistry at Vanderbilt was the weed out course for everybody who came to Vanderbilt to be pre-med, so it was really, really hard. I thought, I don't need to do that. So I took geology, which was really interesting, and I took the freshman geology course uh, Dr. Jewell taught, and uh, they told us, you know, so once you've taken a geology course, you'll never drive through a road cut without looking at the rocks, which is really true, you know, 50, 50 years later. Uh, but it was interesting enough, I went on and took some advanced geology courses, and there was a professor named Richard Stearns, who was great. And uh, I actually had a minor, hours wise, in, in geology. My official minor was French. We had, had a great French background at, at MBA with Miss Hollins and uh, Catherine Mims, who's Dad had taught at, at Vanderbilt in the English department, and uh, but uh, so but that was good, and I got involved, and in, uh, you know I played intramural sports, and I uh, was involved in the fraternity, and we got president of the interfraternity council my, my senior year, which oversaw all of the behavior of the fraternities, which so I worked closely with the dean of men. <laughs> you were people, you know, but mostly behaved in those days, so uh, at least nobody got kicked off campus, as I recall. So. Which fraternity were you in? <laughs> so, which one? Which was I'm fraternity? I'm about else as Yeah, well, I, I, sh I should have known. I mean, <laughs> really. Again, the national connection was strong for the pies. Exactly. But, uh, exactly. But yeah, we, uh, a lot of us, uh, we had a relatively small pledge class, and we've stayed close over the years as well. So, uh, you know, Joe Binkley, one of our MBA classmates, Joe Ray Woods, Mike Doyle, Frank Wentworth, we were all pledges at the same time and went through together. So. Did, uh, when did it sort of, when did law school sort of come on your horizon? You know, I, I was trying to think back about that because we did not have any lawyers in our family. And, uh, uh, you know, I didn't know anything about lawyers other than what I saw on television for the most part. But I guess it was when I was maybe a junior at MBA, uh, Westminster Presbyterian Church for the youth group sponsored uh, a trip to what was then Southwestern in Memphis, uh, Ray Rose. For a, like a vocational assessment weekend, and we took tests and did interviews, and they then they told you what your interests seemed to reflect. Hmm. And mine came back strongly, you know, for about being a lawyer. And I never really thought that much about being a lawyer. I sort of assumed I'd go into one part of my dad's businesses. Uh, I, I worked at the Bottle and Dr Pepper plant during the summer of all four of my summers in high school, and I liked the Bottle business for some reason. It was more interesting to me than the outdoor advertising business. I'm not sure why exactly, but uh, it was kind of a secondary thing for him. But then he sold the bottling plant while I was at Vanderbilt, so that sort of took that off the table. So I thought, well, maybe I'll apply to law school. I took the LSAT and did well on it, and I said, well, maybe I'll just go to law school. And, uh, you know, never had any regrets about that. And after the, my first year, he asked me, he said, do you think this is what you want to do? I said, yes, sir, I do. And he said, okay, I'm going to find a buyer for the for the outdoor plant, my sister wasn't interested in, in taking it over. Right, so, uh, right. That sort of sealed the deal once he sold the plant. <laughs> I, was, I was committed to becoming a lawyer. <laughs> uh, tell us about law school, Bill, what your uh, what the first year was like and some of the professors that really made an impression on you. You know, we had a great class uh, in law school. Uh, you know, it was the first year for the Patrick Wilson program, which is, you know, a merit scholarship. And they gave five named scholarships, and they gave three more that had the financial equivalent that didn't work called Patrick Wilson Scholars. But it brought a lot of really good people to Vanderbilt to uh, actually to apply for that scholarship who decided, John Beasley did a great job of recruiting. You know, we have lots of Ivy League graduates in our, in our law school class. And so it was a really good class, and it, was a, it wasn't cutthroat like a lot of, I mean, I, you know, Charlie, I don't think Harvard was as bad when he was there, but a lot of the Northeastern schools had the reputation for right. being really cutthroat. Right. Ours was a much more collegial class. I mean, people worked together, studied together. There was 
competition, but you weren't really competing against each other, I didn't feel like. You were just sort of competing with yourself to do as well as you could. And, yeah. uh, the law review was important, but it wasn't like the end of the world if no, you weren't it, on it law wasn't, review. You know, and, uh, and, you know, we had a variety of professors. I mean, John Beasley was great as, a, as the assistant dean. Of course, Dean Wade was great. Uh, Professor Hartman was great. I didn't have him for contracts. I had him, uh, had him for corporations, and uh, he was good. Uh, we had some young professors who turned out to be probably better. A lot of them were pretty green our first year. <coughs> Ray, Ray Patterson, who taught civil procedure, I thought was, was good. Uh, Carl Warden was really good. He was a trip. <laughs> None of us will ever forget his staged uh, crimes that committed in the classroom to show people what the, the value or lack of value of eyewitness testimony. And, uh, it's odd that you mention that because just a week ago, Alan Lentz gave his oral history. And I think it was in Alan's class, two years behind us, that, that the police were called. <laughs> and I think that put a real dent yeah, in the yeah, program. Yeah, kind of got, got did himself year after year. Tell us what, um, what you recall about what, what Professor Warden did and the reason that he did it when he would stage these things. Right, right. Hal Bigham was my advisor my third year for my note, and he was, mm -hmm. he was good. And yep. I thought it was UCC, which was pretty dull, but uh, <laughs> so that was sort of new on the horizon. People wouldn't believe that. And just like the federal rules of procedure were pretty new when we got out of law school, yep. so uh, it had been sort of haphazard before that. I think you were law review. I was on law review, yeah. I was an assistant case editor. And do you remember, you, you ended up pretty high in our class, didn't you? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how we finished. They didn't publish the results. I'm pretty sure uh, Dick Berry was probably first, and Sam LaPrell, I think, might have been yeah. second. Uh, I carried the banner at graduation because uh, neither one of them went through graduation for one reason or another, and so I was, was fairly high up there, I guess. But, uh, but you know, well, there were a lot of us sort of clustered at, at the top. Uh, during the summers at law school, did you work? I did. Uh, you know, the summer before we started law school, uh, my dad knew Alf Rutherford, who was the circuit court clerk. So he got me a job working in the circuit court clerk's office, which was great. Uh, you know, I was just an assistant clerk, deputy clerk. I, mean, I learned how to do all the day-to-day -day stuff that lawyers had to know to file stuff and assign cases. I, John Lentz was running, did the minute book entries of copied them and entered them in the minute book, so I learned how to do all that. And uh, when I first started clerking after my first year in law school, and even when I got out of law school, you know, I could walk over to the clerk's office. I knew all the clerks personally. If I didn't know how to do something, I'd say, can you show me how to do this? And they would do, do it and take care of it for me. I met all the, the assistants to the judges. I knew all of them, so that was a great background. And interestingly enough, a lot of people don't know this, given my political leanings, but after my first year in law school, as I mentioned, my dad had gotten involved with the hookers. So I worked both after my first year and my second year as a law clerk at Hooker, Hooker, and Willis over on Union Street. They had neat offices. It was an old building that had exposed brick walls, and there was a lot of coming and going because John Jay was in the midst of starting Mini Pearl and, uh, and some of their other enterprises. So. You know, politicians were in and out all the time. And it was an exciting time oh, at that office. <laughs> but fortunately, there were some good lawyers there as well. Henry actually was a good lawyer. Henry was a corporate lawyer. And uh, he, uh, he was great to work with. Bill Willis was a terrific trial lawyer, so I got to work with Bill Willis. John Chambers was there. John was a good lawyer. Uh, George Sloan, Bill Barr, mm -hmm. not the current attorney general, but, but Bill Barb's dad was a minister out at uh, Woodmont Christian Church for years. So Bill was a good young lawyer. Um, Seymour Samuels, who'd been in the Metro Legal Department and was a real lawyer's lawyer. I didn't know he had been it. He was there. The Seymour course. was amazing. He could, if you were looking for something, uh, a Tennessee decision, he not only could tell you the name of the case, he could give you the citation. <laughs> to the case without ever having to look it up. So, uh, you know, fortunately I got to work with some people who were good lawyers right. and uh, was good trainer. Aaron Wyckoff and John Wagster were there with me, uh, I think the second year. I forgot who was there the first year. But, uh, so we really did learn a lot of law stuff. And, and working with Henry, uh, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals had decided a case under 10b-5 of the Securities Exchange Rules on uh, uh, misrepresentation and disclosures that held for the first time that the failure to disclose material information was as bad as 
publishing false or misleading information. So I ended up, as Henry had me look up that case and the, because they were right in the middle of some public offerings and things. And the, the SEC had just started a computerized tracking of tr trades, which would kick out unusual trades, that, that, particularly by insiders. And that, that case also broadened the definition of who were insiders. So I you know, did some work on that for Henry. I ended up writing my uh, note, my third year note on that decision. So you know, I thought at that time, I thought I wanted to be a tax and securities lawyer because that seemed to be interesting stuff. And you know, the corporate stuff we got in law school, uh, in spite of Herman Troutman and the tax part, <laughs> uh, I thought that's what I wanted to do. But uh, you know, once I got out, I changed my direction. Part of the firm helped me change my direction, but I also found out that the lawyers didn't do much sophisticated tax work when we got out of law school. They did state planning some, but the corporate stuff, the accounting firms really did most of that. Bill Berry was you know, an excellent tax lawyer. But it was really pretty dull. And then Brad Reed had been at Bassbury and Sims for five years when I started. And he was, he and Billy Waller Jr. were considered the, the securities experts, securities law experts in Nashville at that time. And then Jim Cheek came about six months later and you know he jumped right into that. So I thought, well, maybe I need to redirect my <laughs> interest. And the firm redirected me too because of the, they needed some help in the labor area. And that's, you know, I didn't even take labor law in, in law school. So that's, uh, you know, was, that all about. <laughs> well, you you know you're you're a perfect person to talk to about the growth and the ex sort of the, the explosion of growth at, at Bassberry because I remember that when I joined Hooker Keeble Dunson and Harris there were four or five lawyers there and Bassberry had about five maybe six. They already. had a few more than that. Uh, Charlie and I were the thirteenth and fourteenth okay. lawyers at Bassberry to send. Bob Walker joined the year before. He was a year ahead of us in law school, although he was four years older because he done a stint in the Navy. But he was the 12th, and then Charlie and I were the 13th and the 14th. Uh, the firm really had been a family firm up until the time, about 1964, they hired Brad Reed <coughs> and Russ Morris, who were non-family people. And uh, you know, Brad was one of the smartest people I'd ever known. And, and Russ was just a good, hard-working, good lawyer, just a, very practically oriented, did a great deal with clients. And uh, then Warner came in 66, and then, and then they, they hired, strangely enough, Bud Gerlach. <coughs> Bill Berry hired Bud without really talking to any of the other people. And Bud stayed a few years, and then he moved up to National Life in-house. And uh, But Bob Walker came, who was obviously a great lawyer. Charlie and I started, and then uh, we started John Bailey, Jim Gooch, and it was just a succession of really top flight people. And uh, at that time, it was really a family-oriented firm. I mean, everybody knew each other. We knew their spouses, the children. You know, people came to the hospital when we had babies and visited. And uh, it, was, it was really just like a small fraternity, a very close-knit group. And fortunately, we had great mentors. I mean, Mr. Bass was fabulous. And uh, you know, he was, always took a great interest in the younger lawyers. Ted Pappas was really good to work with. They were as opposite as they could be. Yeah. Personality-wise, but Ted was great to work with, and Ted really sort of started pushing the firm to grow and to become a non-totally family firm. He pushed them to start hiring more people and you know hiring top people. You know they didn't recruit at all. I mean I went and knocked on the door. I mean after working two summers at Hooker Hooker and Willis, you know they'd have a securities law problem and they'd say call Brad Reed over Bassbury and Sims. He knows about that. Or they had a labor problem for one of the whale companies, uh, and, and they said, call Whitty Sims over at Bassbury and Sims. He, know, he knows how to, how to deal with the unions and stuff. And so I said, maybe I should want to go talk to those folks. Sound like they have the top top people in town. So I literally went and knocked on the door and said, would y'all be interested? I mean, you know, Hooker Keeble Dodson and the Harris Club Harlan and I had been friends for a long time. You know, they, they right. recruited me. Right. They UN and Dale Luke Connor and the group, they, they re recruited me. And Mr. Gullett's uh, firm recruited me because uh, he knew the Patrick Wilson people. He tried. There were three of us who were Patrick Wilson scholars. They tried to hire, and they offered ten thousand dollars a year, which was unheard of in Nashville oh, man. at that time. So I think Hooker Keeble was six, maybe six hundred or six fifty, and uh, Ted's offer was seven fifty. And I, I negotiated him up to eight hundred, and he said, "I knew you were going to become a labor lawyer <laughs> when I when I hired you because you negotiated me up on the salary." And uh, you know, we uh, I remember we'd been there six months, and he, Ted would come into the, in your office. 
closed the door. He always jingled his change in his pocket. He'd be standing there jingling the change. Bill, yeah, you've been doing a great job. I'm going to give you a $50 a month raise. Gosh, Dad, I really appreciate that. <laughs> I remember those days. And when we joined the firm, we had to bring our own furniture. We had to bring our own desk and chair. And we were in the old American Trust building. And uh, it was pretty crummy at the time. And, you know, they had window air conditioning units and radiators. So in the wintertime, with the radiators, it was either hot or cold. And uh, the pigeons would get underneath. And it was probably the same thing over the National Trust building. The oh, pigeons yeah, would get back underneath to back. the air conditioning units. And they would make so much noise, you had to whack the air conditioning unit to run them off to talk on the telephone. Who else was in the American Trust Building? You know, there were a lot. Waller was there. That's what uh, I thought. Let's see. Uh, Carpenter Firm. Near Herod, Carpenter Firm. Uh, it, it was almost all law firms at right. that time. Right. And, you know, you'd pass each other. Near Herod, uh, we'd, you'd pass each other uh, going up and down. Uh, uh, McCarley, uh, Schumann Pride. Uh, you know, we, they had a tradition. We had two floors. We had the 10th floor and the 11th floor. And we had a little library that was you know, about the size of this area right here on the, on the 10th floor. And at 10 o'clock every day, it was, it was a coffee break. And if you weren't busy, you'd go down and sit and drink a cup of coffee and eat a cookie and uh, just, you know, talk about whatever, politics, uh, sports, or legal questions. And it was so, uh, you know, collegial that uh, Owen White would come up always. He would entertain. He was very entertaining. He'd come up. And, uh, Lewis Pride or Mr. Schulman would come up or something. You know, not many of the, of the Waller people, I don't remember any of them, <coughs> but people from the smaller firms would come up and sit around and just shoot, you know, shoot the breeze. And it was a great way well, you got to know other lawyers and know what was going on. And we tried to continue it when we moved over to the First American Center. And it did for a while, but as we got bigger, it just became more difficult. You, know, you, you just couldn't get it, that many people together. And people were busier and exactly. moving, doing stuff. But, Tell, tell us for a minute about your career and how you developed in these, I guess you would say, the labor commercial litigation area. But tell us about that. Well, you know, our firm had a history of being the, sort of the leading labor firm in Tennessee because Mr. Cecil Sims was a, became a labor lawyer when the National Labor Relations Act was passed in the 1930s and then Woody succeeded him as being the, the firm's guru in, in labor and employment matters. And then when Russ came along, Russ got that. When, you know, when we joined the firm, we did a little of everything at first. And uh, we did it, we searched titles, we represented Dobson and Johnson, which was a big real estate firm. And we had four or five titles to search every two or three days. We'd go down to the title company downstairs and over to the courthouse, search titles. We represented First American, so we did everything from Replevin cars that people had uh, stopped making their payments on or enforcing a note and deed of trust. Uh, and uh, we represented Coons Big K Corporation, which was just beginning to grow. It was kind of a predecessor of Walmart. You know, they had sort of discount stores, and every one of their stores was a separate corporation. So we created a lot of those uh, corporations, you know, did the paperwork, filed them all the stuff with the Secretary of State's office, and we usually ran it. We were runners. We'd run stuff up to the state, file it over to the courthouse and file it. And uh, one of our trips we had to make was from our office at, eight, at the Third Union to the federal courthouse, which was a pretty good hike in the summertime. But the, we learned uh, that the people before us taught us the route. You could go up through the arcade, through Kane Sloan's and Kastner's, through the Sears store at 8th and Church, and then, then you had the long walk down the uh, 8th Avenue over to, to the corner, but you've got to, you know, you could stay out of the rain and snow or out of the heat a little bit going through all those different things. So we did a little of everything. But when I joined, joined as I said, I thought I wanted to be a tax and securities lawyer, but Russ Morris was doing the bulk of the labor and employment work at that time, and he was really busy. Uh, he was representing, Carrier had built a plant down in McMinnville, Tennessee, and Russ was representing that plant. They had another plant over right outside of Memphis in Collierville. It was called Day and Night Manufacturing Company. And Russ was spending a lot of time at Day and Night. They had a campaign, the union won, and then they had to negotiate a contract. So they came and said, would you be willing to help Russ out a little bit on the labor stuff? And I said, well, yeah, but I don't know anything about it. They said, well, you know, you, you can pick it up. You can learn it. So I started going to some seminars. I went with Russ and you know, worked with him on several matters. We represented the newspaper printing corporation, so we got involved in some of their disputes with their various unions they had at the time. We had uh, 
Baird Board Printing Company that was a client, and we you know, had some stuff going on with them. We had a client in uh, Lebanon Precision Rubber Products that had an election and lost. And so I worked with Russ. And I, it, it was Russ had been thrown into the water by Woody Sims, and he sort of threw me into the water. And I, I learned on the, on the go, so to speak. Uh, one of my first, I, could, I think it was my first argument at the Sixth Circuit was an NLRB case that we had handled for a little small. Uh, firm here in town, a guy got fired and he claimed that he had been engaged in a protected concerted activity, which is the definition under the National Labor Relations Act, but uh, they said, well, he was just a complainer all the time, and the NLRB had found against the company, they said, well, that was, he was engaged in a concerted activity, which meant you had to work with or on behalf of other employees, and uh, the, the, the uh, you know, trying cases before the NLRB was interesting because it was kind of a stack deck. When the, when the union or employee filed an unfair labor practice charge, the board would investigate the charge. And they, we would provide affidavits from our witnesses to say why, you know, why we didn't violate the law. And of course, they would get statements from the union folks, the employees, well, you didn't have access, there was no discovery. So you didn't have any access to what they had. They had your affidavits from your people, so they knew what your folks were gonna say. You didn't know what their folks were gonna say. And under their procedure, if a witness testified in a hearing, you could then request a copy of their affidavit to use to cross-examine them. Well, they handed it to you in the courtroom and they would excise anything that didn't seem to be relevant. So they would cut it out so you get things look like a paper doll, you know, to use it to cross-examine the witness. And then the administrative law judge, who were NLRB employees, was your judge. If you appealed, you appealed to the NLRB in Washington. That was your appeal. And then, finally, you could petition a court of appeals either for review of the board decision or they could petition to enforce their decision. And the standard uh, before the Court of Appeals was a little more uh, employer friendly. It was, you know, was there substantial evidence on the record as a whole to support the NLRB's finding? So my first case was to argue of an NLRB case at the Sixth Circuit. And I remember going up there and I was scared to death to go up, you know, up here before the Sixth Circuit. and. Uh, I went up the day ahead, you know, spent the afternoon in the court library preparing for the next morning. And, uh, but it was really refreshing because I'd been, you know, before some general sessions judges, and I don't think I'd argued a case in the Tennessee Court of Appeals. But, you know, the, the court had cleared, they'd read the briefs, they knew what the case was about, they asked relevant questions, and uh, it was, you know, it was a fun experience. I, you know, over my career, I probably argued 30 or 40 cases in the Sixth Circuit, and it was always a fun experience to go up there. So, but that's how I started out doing that. And we were, you know, the firm represented a lot of national companies that, uh, uh, of course, First American, uh, Kusan, uh, Aladdin. We didn't really represent Aladdin until later on. Uh, Genesco, uh, uh, just a bunch of them that the firm had represented. And a lot of them had labor issues. And so we were involved in a lot of those things had the reputation and then uh, there was a lot of union organizing activity in the 70s. So we had a lot of clients that had got petitions that filed for elections and we would work with the companies developing their anti-union campaign and you, know, you had to be very careful what you said and how you said it and, uh, and if you won the election that was great, it was the end of it, but if you lost the election there were some, some even sometimes when you won the union to file objections claiming the company had threatened employees or threatened to close the plant or things like that. So you would get into the investigation. Sometimes you had to redo the election. I represented the Tappan plant up in Springfield, which later is now the Electrolux plant. But we had, I think, four or five successive elections up there that a couple, couple, most of them we won. One got set aside, we had to do it over and things. So we had a lot of those. Uh, the Firestone plant was built out in Laverne. We got hired to represent them. Uh, they won three or four elections, and in fact, you and I had a case involving that plant. I think we on. did. But uh, we had a lot of uh, a lot of those companies that had union issues or labor issues, and uh, so we were running around all the time. Cousin had a plant up in Henderson, Kentucky, one in Franklin, two here in Nashville. They had union elections, and uh, uh, you know, if you lost the election, then you got involved in negotiating a, a new contract with the union, and. Uh, it was really important to get the language right in the contract because people always thought, you know, well, it's the economic effect of the union getting into a plant. And that had some effect, but not much. It was more limiting the company's ability to manage its workforce and move people around and do what they needed to operate the plant efficiently. So, Who uh, 
Who were your opponents over the years? I'm, I'm guessing George Barrett was one of the regulars. Yeah, you know, we got to know the uh, most of the union reps for the various unions. The ones that were the most active in those days were the Teamsters. There was a guy named Corky Ellis who ran the Teamsters, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the guy before him, uh, I'm excuse me, right, the men, Machinist Union, the Retail Clerks Union, they were the most active. And so we got to know their union reps and, and dealt with them a lot of the time. But, when the lawyers got involved, Cecil Brandstetter and George Barrett represented virtually all of the unions in town. Right. You know, the, the, Cecil represented the Teamsters, and George represented the retail clerks. I think uh, Cecil represented the machinists. They represented the uh, amalgamated meat cutters and things. So we had a lot of cases with them. And then later, as Jim Strange and Jan Jennings came along, they we, we do arbitration cases under the contracts. And, and Cecil didn't do many arbitrations by the time I came along. He, moved on to some other things, but uh, George got involved a lot, particularly in strike situations where we'd go into state courts and get injunctions. You know, George would show up the day of the hearing with, you know, five motions that you've never seen before and file, and uh, he was always interesting to deal with. Uh, but, uh, and, uh, but those were the two main local lawyers, and uh, some of them had lawyers from out of town that we would end up dealing with. Over the years, Bill, are there any particularly memorable cases for you or ones that you would like to tell about? You know, I had an interesting career because I had a lot of uh, interesting cases. You know, some of the strike situations were interesting. We had, you know, I got involved early on with uh, some big strikes at companies. There was a mobile home manufacturing plant up in Westmoreland, Tennessee, that involved a company called Fleetwood Homes, which is a big, big company. They had a lot of violence. Strikes were kind of a game in the South. It, we didn't have a lot of labor activity. So people thought if you were carrying a picket sign, you could get away with anything. And, and some of the lo local courts and judges, and particularly law enforcement people, sort of looked that other way. You know, they were throwing rocks at cars, dragging people out of cars, and beating them up, and you know, throwing nails in the driveways and stuff like that. So it was it was pretty knocked down, drag out. And the only remedy you really had, I mean, you could go to the NLRB, but the, you know, you could get an injunction from the state court. So I got to, you know, we worked with a lot of state court, particularly chancellors issuing injunctions, but the problem with those were they were not self-enforcing. The, the police couldn't go out and arrest somebody for contempt of court. You had to go back and file a contempt petition, and so you had to collect the evidence. And, you know, and we didn't have videos back then. We would hire professional photographers who would take movies, and we took a lot of, you know, still shots of people engaged in unlawful activity. And uh, then you'd go in and cite them for contempt, and basically had to prove your case in court that they were guilty of what you're accused them of, and so well, those were really interesting. And, and um, so but we had several of those. Samsonite had a plan in Murfreesboro, had a big long strike that went on for several weeks, and uh, with a lot of violence. And Stanley Tools had a plant down in Shelbyville, a new plan, they lost an election and had a long strike that drug out. A lot of violence went on for people tried to burn the plant down, a lot of stuff. So a lot of those were interesting. Uh, I was lucky that in my first five or six years, Title VII had just been passed in 1964, you know, right before we got out of law school. And the cases under that were just beginning to get filed by the time we got out of law school. The AIDS Discrimination Act was passed in 1967, so it was brand new when we got out of law school. So I got, I had three big class actions that I tried in my first few years of practicing law. Uh, one was the GE had a plant out in Hendersonville, and uh, they got sued. Avon Williams represented uh, a plaintiff and it filed as a class action. He, he, he had one plaintiff who was fired, so he, uh, he, he represented the folk, anybody who'd been fired because they were black. One uh, had not been hired, and that was the main guy, and so he represented anybody who had applied at the plant and didn't get hired because they were minorities, and, uh, and there was a third class. Uh, Judge Nixon tried that case. No, I think Judge Morton tried that case. And then I had another one for the Firestone plant out in Laverne. So Avon again represented all of them. Uh, multiple plaintiffs, you know, class action. And then I had one for Ockerland Productions and WSM involving uh, a guy who was a black lighting guy at Ockerland Productions, but they expanded it out. And uh, so I tried all three of those cases, which was great experience. Uh, Judge Nixon had two of them. It took us a year to try one of them in front of Judge Nixon because we'd only get like three or four days at a time. Then we'd come back three months later and do another two or three days. And, you know, and then once we finished it, it took him another two years to decide the case. Uh, Judge Crenshaw was his clerk at the time, I think. And, uh, 
So, but those were great experiences. Uh, I had a number of, Vanderbilt became one of my biggest clients. I spent a lot of time working for Vanderbilt. How did that happen? You know, the firm represented Vanderbilt. Okay. And Mr. Cecil Sims had been on the board of trust. And Woody Sims got involved in the big urban renewal project when they took the land that surrounded the university you know, all the way out to Blair and they had a big fight with the neighbors over that. So we were representing the university on a lot of different things. Um, we had a, uh, a, a labor campaign. Again, I think uh, George was involved in that one. They formed a union, well, actually Cecil initially, they formed a union in their craft people, the people who play plumbers and painters and electricians and things to have a union election. And uh, Russ and I were involved in that. And uh, the, the union, they were successful, but they only represented a relatively small number of people at the university. So I got involved in negotiating the first contract for that. Uh, Jeff Carr, who was two years ahead of us in law school, had started at the university after he graduated, primarily working in the alumni development office, doing uh, wills and trusts for people giving donations to the university. And I, they named him general counsel, I think the year we got out of law school, 69 maybe. So we worked with Jeff, and then John Callison came about 1973, and I always kidded John as being the uh, result of the university's affirmative action plan because he graduated from UT Law School. <laughs> but John and I worked together really closely for 40 years and a whole lot of different kinds of cases. And you know, representing the university was interesting because of the types of issues that came up. I mean, you know, they had 25,000 employees in the last few years, and when the, before the medical center split off, so you always had a lot of issues, you had academic issues, people that didn't get tenure and claimed it was because of their sex race or whatever, or you had student discipline issues and in later years and students were afraid to sue their university for kicking them out of school. But uh, we got the, they had just started the Graduate School of Management about the time we got out of law school. And they had two black students in the first class at the Graduate School of Management and they took them because they really wanted the Epson University. They really shouldn't have been in the class. They weren't very well qualified. And, and the whole school was a little odd. They brought this guy named Igor Ansoff in to, to run the school. And it was a touchy-feely management school. It was not a hard you know, finance and, and management and personnel and all that stuff. It right. was really strange. But both of those students ran afoul of the Honor Council. They turned in a, a computer program that the guy who taught the course, there's no way you could have come up with these identical programs by chance. You had to copy somebody's, and they, they did. So they booted them out of school, and they sued the university. Russell, per, uh, Russell uh, uh, shoot, uh, Enix represented those two. So I tried that case. Which court did that? It was in federal court, and it was interesting because it was in Judge Gray's court, and Russell filed a motion for Judge Gray to recuse himself because he had gone to Vanderbilt and he thought he would be biased. Well, Judge Gray didn't go to Vanderbilt, but he got so mad, he told Enix, he said, Russell, Mr. Enix, he said, I didn't go to Vanderbilt. I have no bias towards Vanderbilt, and I'm biased against you. So I am going to recuse myself. So uh, the Sixth Circuit appointed Bailey Brown, uh, who was a district judge in Memphis, to come up here and try the case. And That's a great it. story. He tried it, and uh, you know we tried it for several days, and uh, he ended up holding, you know, for the university and just just missing the case, and. Uh, and then, you remember Jimmy Lowenthal, who was a year or two behind us at MBA. He was a student in that first class, and when those, I think it was a two-year program, they decided they wanted to have a doctoral program. Well, it was very poorly put together. I mean, it was kind of a, you know, we're, we'll figure this out as we go along sort of thing. Well, the students paid their money and started into this doctoral program, and it was a disaster. It basically just fell apart. So they sued the university for, you know, failing to have right. a program right. But Bob Brandt tried that case. And uh, we ended up, they, they, they sued not only to get their tuition back, but for millions of dollars in lost income because they didn't get their doctorate degree. And uh, Bob sort of saw through it, and he ended up holding, they could get their tuition back, but dismissed everything else. So we counted that as a win. <laughs> right. And then uh, on the heels of that, uh, Elizabeth Langland, who was the first female professor in the English department, came up for tenure in, in that department. And the department, you know, your dad was involved. It was, oh, I had remember a lot of that. people we had as professors, and your dad's kind of yeah. But they had a lot of younger people who had joined the department. They voted in a split vote. I think Maureen Bell was the chairman of the department at that time. They voted in a split vote to recommend her for tenure. 
the dean of the College of Art and Science was Jack Mowgli at that time, and she had been appointed in English, but that was the whole idea of women's studies was just coming onto the uh, stage at that time. And so a lot of the work she had done, published work, was in the field of women's studies, not English literature. Jack Mowgli, when he reviewed her file, said, I don't think she makes a case out to be tenured in the English department. He said, we had a women's studies department, maybe so, but we don't have a women's studies department. So George Barrett represented Elizabeth, who was a nice person and a good teacher, but uh, we tried that case in front of Judge Morton, who we found, for, he, he liked Jack Mowgli. He, they were sort of the same type person. Uh, they were you know, cut to the chase and uh, very matter of fact, and uh, he ended up dismissing the case. They appealed it in the Sixth Circuit upheld it, so that was a big, big case early on. Vanderbilt did not have another tenure denial case brought for 20 years after that, but as a result of that, they appointed a committee who studied the whole tenure system, and they made a lot of changes in the whole process, which you know, made it easier for people to get through and, and different things, and, and had, a, had an internal review procedure, which really was a big help. Bill, of all the the cases and the judges that you had in federal court, which one did, was the one that you sort of took a liking to the best? The judges? Yeah. Well, I love Judge Morton. You know, I had a very interesting experience with Judge Morton. <clears throat> and I, he got appointed right after we started practicing law. I think, I think he got appointed in January of 1970. <clears throat> and as you remember, you know, the people, the lawyers up to that time, if you had a case you didn't really want to try, you'd file it in federal court because it didn't come up for years. It just sat over there, you know, nothing ever happened. He changed that. He changed that. You know, he started having docket calls and calling. I remember he'd call people down and say, you know, Mr. Aiden, how long is this case going to take to try? And he'd say, oh, Judge, this is a three or four day trial. I said, no, you don't understand. These are all one day cases. Now, how many hours is it going to take us to try? So a lot of cases got dismissed or settled. But uh, early on, I was supposed to be in his courtroom one morning at 9 o'clock or something. I don't even remember what it was. But my phone, I was sitting in my office in the American Trust Building. The phone rang, and I said, hello, and I said, uh, Mr. Osher, this is Junior Cross. And I said, oh, Ms. Cross, how are you? She said, where are you? I said, well, I'm sitting here in my office. And she said, why aren't you in our courtroom? I said, oh, crap. I made record time to get from uh, third and union to eighth and broad and got in, you know, raced into the courtroom and Judge Morton. I said, Mr. Osher, everybody's entitled to one mistake. You've had yours. <laughs> That's that he and I thought Morton. alike. Uh, he was a cut to the chase guy which I was, that's the way I tried cases. Probably why I was maybe not as good with juries as I was in front of judges, because you didn't, I, you know, with jury you do things and you back up and do it over again, and you do it three or four times, make your point. Judge Morton was, you know, I want you prepared. I don't want all your shuffling papers up here at the roster, but you, you be prepared and you present your case. You know, he was the first judge, as I remember, that started the rule that to, to introduce a witness. People like to ask the witness, you know, what's your name? Where have you been? Where do you work? What do you do? Kind of get them a little loosened up on the, he said, you read all that in as a narrative and say, is that right? And then the first question went to the merits, which is, you know, the right way to try a case. So he taught me how to try cases the right way. You know, my impression was that with Judge Morton, if he knew you were trying, he would always give you that extra chance, even yeah. though you might make a mistake, if he knew you were trying hard. Yeah, he had a great philosophy. I remember him saying, uh, somebody said, you know, Judge, you decided this wrong. He said, you know what? So I decided the cases the way I think they ought to be decided, and that's why they have a court of appeals. If I'm wrong, they'll reverse me. So uh, he didn't get reversed very often. But he was great. Uh, Judge Higgins was great. Judge Wiseman, I you know, I tried, I tried cases in every district court in Tennessee, in all three of the Eastern District locations, um, uh, Knoxville, uh, Greenville, uh, Winchester, all the Western District, and then all. You know, Columbia, Cookville, because Judge Morton, of course, moved to Cookville in later years, so all his cases got tried up there. But Judge Morton was great, and we had really good judges. Um, you know, I, I didn't try nearly as many cases in state courts. You know, I appeared before the, a lot of the chancellors over there. I had the case with Bob Brandt, and I had appeared before Bob several times. Um, you know, I remember uh, Ed Davies, Frank DeWoto, Ben Cantrell. My favorite state court judge is Ellen Lyle. I thought Ellen was a great judge. He is a great judge. Right. Right. She's smart. Uh, she's very. She's got great demeanor. She's uh, respectful of, of the lawyers, but she, but she you know keeps you online. But I think if we had more judges like that, it'd uh, be good. I never tried a case in front of our friend and classmate Joe Bentley. I just never. I didn't have many circuit court cases. I had chancery cases. But right. uh, they were, Bailey Brown also was really good. And then on the Sixth Circuit, 
Pierce Lively was one of my favorite judges. He was, again, he was very polite and but smart and, you know, asked good questions and to the point. And uh, so, uh, uh, you know, they, they were some of my, my favorites. Let's take a minute and let you go back. Now that we've talked about your career, let's talk about the firm. And I know that you're a good person to ask about this because it, for a period of time, you were the managing partner at Bassberry and Sims. And give us a sort of a brief history of how Bassberry has grown and what happened. Well, you know, the growth was pretty gradual from the time I started for the next 20, well, 10 years, maybe 10 or 12 years. Uh, we didn't really have a very formal structure until we moved to the new building. About that time, we went through the planning for the new office. It was kind of funny because uh, we were trying to work with the decorators to pick out the decor and colors and whatever. So Mr. Bass and Russ and I think Ted Pavlis went down to uh, to Memphis. Uh, one of the big firms down there had recently moved into a, into a new office. and. Uh, they told him, said, you know, you can't do this by committee. He said, you need to put one person in charge. And we, not only could we not decide what color we liked, we couldn't even decide what color we were looking at. <laughs> so so at, as a, about that time, Brad really pushed the firm to develop a, a, a management structure and a more formal uh, partnership structure. Uh, we, for many years, were on a lockstep system. You know, you came in at a level and then you moved up year to year and forgot what their course was, it was like 10 or 12 years, you become a full partner, four points, and, and, uh, and that worked fine for, for years, and uh, we, about Ted Pappas had been sort of the informal managing partner for several years, and did a good job, because he was not a family person, and he'd been at South, the, the telephone company for years, and been in-house, so he was used to, you know, having some structure and management right. ideas, but I think, as I remember, uh, Warner Bass was the first managing partner after Ted. And then Jim Cheek did, Jim was just too busy. Jim did it maybe a year or two. Then Charlie did it a year or two. And then James Gooch did it for a couple of years. And then I became the managing partner in 1987. And I was the first one who went more than a year or two. I was a managing partner for six years. And I maintained an active practice at the time. But when I took over, we had about 40 lawyers, and when I turned it over to first Mike Peek and then Keith Simmons, uh, we had about 60 lawyers. So we did a lot of growing in that period of time. We yeah. opened our first branch office in Knoxville during that, that time. We looked at Memphis. We really wanted to go to Memphis, but we couldn't find the right combination of people. There were a couple of firms down there who were really interested, but they, want, they, they knew they had some people who needed to be weeded out. They wanted us to acquire the whole firm and then weed out the deadwood. We said, we're not doing that. You all weed them out and then we'll talk to you. <laughs> so we did that. Um, but we uh, became a lot more formal in how we did things. Uh, we had you know, a recruiting committee. We had an associate development committee that worked with bringing people along. Uh, more formal, we had you know, supervising partners with young associates to work with them. It was kind of haphazard when we came along. It's just whoever you happen to work with. Uh, Frank Berry was a great mentor. Um, before he passed away, Frank would come in and sit in your office and you could ask Frank anything and he'd sit there and explain to you, this is how we do it, this is why we do it, and things. And uh, everybody else was kind of too busy to fool with. So, well, not everybody, but you know, Russ Morris was great to work with. Uh, a lot of the younger folks were, Brad was great, the Chief was great. And you know, we all tried to take time as we brought people along, but we got a lot more formal in how we did it, evaluating associates so they knew how they were doing and you didn't get a surprise come along saying you're, you're not doing very well. So, And the period that where you were the managing partner of, that was a period where the whole law profession was in a tremendous growth cycle. Yeah, it really was. You know, there were some good things and some bad things about that. I, you know, being in the labor and employment side, we began to see more competition from out-of-town law firms. There were a lot of specialty labor law firms in particular when I came along. Most of them are headquartered in Atlanta. They had big firms down there. And you know, we were sort of the leading firm in Nashville, and then some other firms started doing more labor practice. But I started having a client seminar every year for our clients, and we weren't inviting people off the street. But we just, we had a lot of great clients, and we didn't see a lot of them very often, so we would do a day-long seminar. 
and you know, do updated on the, on the law and discuss some current topic and have lunch and you know cocktails afterwards. And we started a, a, late, a newsletter sent out on new developments and things. So we kind of started a little bit of that marketing doing that, but it became much more pronounced for the firms as a whole. Everybody had to have a brochure and all kinds of stuff to try to market themselves to clients. Clients were doing more com competing for, for the business instead of just sticking with one law firm for years and unless something really bad happened, they right. kept them. Right. And, you know, we had a lot of clients that had been clients of the firm for many years that we're fortunate to have. But it did change a lot. And um, How did you manage to, um, to grow so aggressively, but still keep a high quality of of attorney. Well, we we had a you know we we recruit we've always recruited at Vanderbilt. We get we hired a lot of Vanderbilt graduates. As the UT law school began to improve, we started to hire people at the very top of the UT classes. Uh, we then expanded out. We went to North Carolina and Duke and Virginia and WNL, you know, sort of the top southeastern law school who had people who wanted to stay in the South, didn't want to go to New York or Washington or Boston, the big Chicago, the big cities. They wanted a quality of life for, for their families that, that Nashville offered. That, and, you know, we had this sophisticated law practice with a better place to live, and so we were able to attract some really good people to, to come here. And you know, we lost some over the years of so in-house positions and or to other law firms, but uh, that we were able to do that. And uh, uh, we really worked hard and get good people and people that would sort of fit the culture of the firm and you know, after, after you, you reach a point it gets harder to do that when you you know once you pass 100 it's, it's sort of hard I mean, you can still get good quality but it's hard to get people who really want to spend their career how did the sections break down bill uh, how did that work well that probably we started that actually i think before maybe i became managing partner but we formalized it with practice deals while I was managing partner, we had a litigation group, and you know, we, I, I think Bob Walker was part of the head of the litigation group originally. We had a corporate securities group, which either Brad or Jim Cheever, the two of them, and uh, we had a tax and, and state planning, which James Gooch did. We had the labor section, which Russ and I kind of headed up. Uh, Charlie was, we had the, the bond section and a, a commercial section. Uh, you know, real estate, it was, they were sort of lumped together, the bonds and commercial law, the real estate folks and all. So we had about five or six practice groups with a practice head that sort of ran those and you know, they looked for people that would fit in their group primarily. And that helped you know, maintain some of the congeniality of a smaller group rather than everybody having to be, be part of a great big conglomeration. So. And following your term, uh, then a very shortly after that, Keith Simmons became managing partner for I, I, many years. I, 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 I had to sort of pick my successor, and I narrowed it down to Mike Peak and Keith Simmons, and I sort of picked Mike, and Mike didn't like it. He yep. did it for maybe a year, and he just didn't like doing it. I mean, Mike's a great lawyer and, good, and, and a great guy. He, he didn't like sort of looking over people's shoulders and telling them what to do and things, and so he stepped down, and Keith became the managing partner. And, for life, <laughs> he did it for 16 years, and uh, you know that's a long time. But he basically gave up his practice. I mean, we were big enough by that point in time. You couldn't be a full-time practicing lawyer and a managing partner. I, I was able to do it. Uh, it was hard because when you have, as you know, when you have a litigation practice, you don't set your own schedule all the time. Either other lawyers or the courts that set your schedule. So if you're more of an office lawyer, you can be a little more flexible. Uh, I had two really interesting things I had to deal with when I was managing partner. We had Perry March, who worked for us, and uh, we had an attractive young paralegal who started getting anonymous letters that became more and more explicit. And uh, we tracked down and discovered Perry was the source of those things, so we had to ask Perry to go somewhere else before he uh, was accused of murdering his wife. And uh, Tom Neville, you may remember, who was a great lawyer, a uh, really good lawyer got himself mixed up with with Russell Brothers, and you know ended up being charged with the money right. laundering. I recall that in federal court, and, and which was a tragedy because Tom was a great guy and a great lawyer, but just got sidetracked. And so I, I had a couple of big biggies to deal with, <laughs> and it helped to have been an employment lawyer because you know I had a lot of employment type issues when I was managing partners. So that's what it's people just not turning their time in or not sending bills or whatever. You know you had to go sit down. And, Council will. When did you finally decide to retire? 
Uh, I retired at the end of 2017. Uh, you know, I really enjoyed being a lawyer uh, for a lot of years. It had gotten to be where it was less pleasant towards the end. You know, as I said, I had a lot of great, great cases of things that were that I worked on. I had a lot of great clients over the years. I got to work with a lot of managers at good com big companies, uh, GE, Firestone, good, uh, Goodyear, uh, just a lot of a lot of local companies that we represented for years and years. The Thompsons, Thompson Machinery. Those folks, the people around Aladdin, uh, really good people. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, litigation had gotten to be so much more contentious that it was sort of unpleasant a lot of the time. Uh, that was, and, and more of my practice, you know, I really enjoyed the, the old traditional labor law stuff. I mean, I didn't mind butting heads with union guys. I mean, that's just the way it worked. I mean, you, you know, they call you names and do all kinds of stuff, and you sit down and shake hands and get over it after it's done. Cecil, Branstad or George Barrett and I had a great relationship. We were opponents all the time, but it was a cordial, uh, you know, adversarial relationship. Uh, we could sit down and have a drink or a beer or just talk about stuff. Charlie Ray, other Charlie Ray, Pat Charlie, that we used to call him, that was with Barrett right. for many years. Charlie and I had a lot of cases together. Um, Harry Burnett in Chattanooga was a plaintiff's employment lawyer. Harry and I had a great relationship. We had sons who were pole vaulters together and you know, against each other. And uh, had it gotten harder to have that? Good yeah, I think it really had. Relations. I mean, you know, we had a lot of younger lawyers coming along, and if, if I had a young lawyer on the other side, it seemed like they had to show you how tough they were or hard they could be, and I had the conversation with me and said, you know, we, we can do this as, as difficult or as easy as you want to. I'd prefer easy. I said, oh, we, we thought you were going to be hard to deal with. So I'm really not hard to get along with, you know, just as long as, as, long as you do what you say you're going to do, and, you know, I can, I, I can take your word and know that that's, Mean something, you know, we get along fine. And, uh, but it did get more contentious. You know, judges got a little more contentious. Uh, you know, when you and I came along, lawyers settled cases just on the telephone or sitting down over a drink and they settled their cases. We didn't have to have a mediator or a settlement judge to settle a case. Now, you, you can't talk to each other about, about settlement. I mean, it's just, it seems to be hard. You know, Judy Griffin was great as a settlement judge in federal court. I mean, she was a magistrate judge, but Julia. She would keep people, she would keep you there at midnight if that's what it took to settle a case, but she worked at it and she was really good at it. Uh, but, you know, some of it is just kind of going through the motions and uh, it just got to be where it was not as pleasant. And I was, it was getting to the point where I was not as busy. I went, you know, you give up some stuff. When I was managing part and I turned some clients over to uh, younger lawyers and some I got back and some I didn't over the years. And so it was getting to the point, my Vanderbilt work was keeping, I had a couple of big cases I was doing for Vanderbilt. I had one that I said, when I finish this case, I think it's gonna be time for me to, to hang it up. And it was in front of Ellen Lyle. Uh, Richard Braun was on the other side. Richard and I had a lot of cases over the years. And Richard could be tr trying at times, but we got along fine. And uh, this case uh, was a, a, a woman who was a pathologist in the medical center, a breast pathologist. She worked with a guy who was the renowned breast pathologist in the country for really, many years. But she got unhappy with the new, they brought in a new chairman of the department who she didn't like. And uh, so she decided she was going to start her own breast pathology business outside of Vanderbilt while she was still a Vanderbilt employee. And once they found out about it, they terminated her. And Richard filed a lawsuit and a breach of contract claim against the university. And we filed a counterclaim against her for all the money. She, she'd take it in like, Hundred fifty thousand dollars for that period of time. We filed a countersuit. And Ellen dismissed her claim, and Vanderbilt recovered one hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's a good, good time to, to retire. That's a good one to quit on. <laughs> tell me, tell me what you've been doing since retirement. What What are your interests outside of your practice? Well, I didn't really know what I was going to do. I didn't have a real plan when I was walked out the door, and I really pulled a Band-Aid off. I've only been back to the office maybe three or four times in 18 months, and only for very brief periods of time. Right before I left, back when I was growing up, I had a model railroad, and then when after not too long after Ann and I got married, we moved, and I had a room downstairs, so I built another model railroad when my kids were little, and when we moved, I dismantled it and never put it back together. So that's one thing. I thought, well, maybe I'll do another model railroad. I didn't have a great place to do it in our current house, but. I was looking online to see if there were any hobby shops left in Nashville, and there weren't many, but I came across the Nashville Steam Preservation Society website, which is the group that's restoring the old steam engine out in Centennial Park, and I said, you know, 
had my be interested instead of working on a mild train, I work on a big train and a big engine. And uh, so I went out and volunteered and uh, I've done work sessions and I discovered pretty early on they needed somebody to be a spokesperson for the group to help them raise money. And I told them, I said, you know, I may not be able to weld or use an acetylene torch, but I'm used to standing on my feet and talking to people so I can uh, do some presentations. So I have spoken to Rotary Clubs all over the Mid-State, um, Kiwanis Clubs, uh, groups of people, and have been sort of their face person for a lot of things, and uh, I've enjoyed that. Uh, I volunteered, our first Christian here in church has got a big, they have a barn and uh, some pastures in the back part of their property out there on Franklin Road, and they decided to start a uh, equine therapy program for adults where there's a one out on Old Hills for a road for kids for, with mental and physical disabilities. They found that relating to horses helps people both with their physical disability, they learn balance, some strength, and just the working with the horses uh, is, helps them. So this, ours is geared towards adults and including uh, like veterans that come back you know, with PTSD or physical disability. So I grew up with horses, even we lived on Estes Wood, and we had two horses in our back, back there, and uh, when, you know, when I was born, my parents lived on a farm and was around horses, so I'm a very uh, overqualified stable man. I muck out stalls and groom horses and <laughs> a couple of days a week, so that's giving me something to do, and other than that, I, I read a lot and just kind of been enjoying life. Bring us up to date on your family. Well, Ann, we have four kids. Uh, our oldest, uh, Mary Ann, is a physician's assistant in Boise, Idaho. She works with orthopedic groups. Uh, she did back surgeries primarily for about 10 or 12 years, but she went back into sports medicine. Cause she said, I got tired of fat people coming in complaining about their back or coming in to ask for opioids to kill the pain. And said, so, you know, they don't always get, even the ones that want to get better, a lot of times, you know, neck and back injuries can be pretty severe. So that's kind of depressing. So she's back into sports medicine. Now, and most people with sports injuries want to get better and do get better. And, so that's a more enjoyable practice. So she, and she's got one little girl who's 11 now, and Marianne's her soccer coach. Marianne played soccer one year at the University of North Carolina on the national championship team, so she's a really good athlete. She is the most fit person I know. <laughs> she is incredible. And uh, so she's out there. Ellen, our second, uh, who also went to the University of North Carolina, went back and got a master's in social work degree. She's a hospice and palliative care social worker at the University of North Carolina Hospital. She was a photographer for years. She was one of the first photojournalism graduates in North Carolina and worked for the Durham Herald Sun for years. Got to cover all wow. the New Carolina basketball games, sit down on the floor, and, and it was great. She enjoyed doing it, but uh, she decided she wanted to do something else with her life. And, uh, then our, our third daughter, Catherine, uh, lives in Atlanta. She married a, a boy from Atlanta, uh, Howell Mill Road. He's one of the Howells. That, family ran the Howell Mill back. His dad was a captain in the Georgia Artillery during the Civil War and fought at Lookout Mountain and Battle of Peachtree Creek. And she has three kids. Uh, the oldest will be a freshman at uh, 11 next year. And Wonderful. The second who's a, be a seventh grader and then one who's a second grader. Uh, and so she's a mom. And uh, she was president of her sorority in Georgia and so she's an organizer. She's real active in the kids' school and does all kinds of things. And then John, John our youngest is the only one who's here. He has two little girls, uh, so I don't have anybody to go to the NBA. But John is in the music business. Uh, he started out, uh, he got an internship for a company called Sugar Hill Records in Durham, North Carolina, but then got offered a job at Curb Records here in Nashville. Came to Nashville, worked for Curb for 10 years, and I told him, I said, you're getting a PhD in music, working with Mike Curb, which he did very closely. And uh, he became the head of A&R for them, which is the He's a songwriter himself. He had two number one hits that he wrote, actually. And uh, so he's been very successful. And then he left Curb to go to work for a publishing company, not a record label, called Olay Music, which was headquartered in Toronto. He ran their national office for them for five or six years. And he just recently got hired away from Olay by a much bigger publishing company that has been looking for somebody to start their national office for 10 years and couldn't find the right person. They met John by happenstance and invited him to come up and said, would you be interested in coming to work for us? And he said, well, make me an offer, which, which they did. <laughs> so he just started back in March with a company called Reservoir in Music, which is uh, much broader than just country music. Uh, John's going to run their country music publishing. But, uh, so he's here in town. 
Well, that's that's and a I wonderful have, story. Of, and I've been married 52 years as of last Monday. Bill, tell us um, just to sort of cap off. It's been such a pleasure to have you give your history and the history of your office and your family. Uh, any any thoughts about law practice and changes, good or bad, that have happened during your career? You know, I mean, I guess that's one reason I decided to retire. That when we started practicing law, it was really a profession. I mean, you, know, I, you had a relationship with clients. You were a counselor and. A lot of my clients over the years were day-to-day -day clients. They would call me once or twice a week with a personnel problem. You know, somebody's not doing this. We need to get rid of them. Or we need this. We got this issue. We got a sexual harassment claim. How do we handle it? Or we, whatever it was. Uh, and and, and you know, so we had ongoing relationships. A lot of folks in litigation. You know, you have a client. You have one case, and once it's like a doctor. You know, once you fix their bad knee, you don't see them again for a while. But uh, my clients uh, were people who I represented. I have one, several clients I represented for over 40 years, and they were family-owned businesses. I was on the second or third generation of the family and had a great relationship. That part I enjoyed. Uh, the, I think the commercialization of the profession, I think, was probably not a good thing. Uh, you know, I understand the, the, the idea that the, the public needs to have information to be able to choose a lawyer, but it, it, it just galls me to see what I call hucksterism. You know, on the t you can't watch the TV without seeing four lawyer ads for whatever the hottest new toy is, whether it's a, you know, Roundup or uh, asbestos or whatever it is. You know, out there trying to get folks to come in and sign up. And I, I don't, find, I don't view that as a good thing. And maybe it is. I mean, since I'm not a, never was a plaintiff's lawyer, but the good plaintiff's lawyers always seem to find plenty of uh, work uh, from good clients and good cases without having to go out. And, Beat the bushes for it. Same thing in the, in the commercial or uh, corporate law. I mean, corporate lawyers, of course, the clients are more sophisticated, so they can find lawyers and pick and choose uh, with a little more in, intelligence than the, the average person on the street. But you know, when, for many, many years, people hired you because of your reputation. I said, you know, Gareth Davis is a really good trial lawyer. Bill Ogier is a really good labor and employment lawyer. He's, he's who you ought to hire. And for years, we got lots of referrals from small town lawyers, and they get a labor problem. They didn't know. What so they you know, would call Cecil Sims or Woody Sims or Russ or me, and you know, we get clients all over the state. At one point in time, I had clients from from Union City to Chip to Copper Hill and from Kingsport to Memphis, you know, all over the state, literally. And uh, it was great. It was fun. I got to see all kinds of stuff made and uh, worked with a lot of great people. But uh, I think the profession has not improved itself over the years. Now, it'd be hard for me to actually recommend. To, to any of my children to be a lawyer today. You know, the, the, what you said about being able to have a real relationship with a client, know them and understand them, work with them over a period of years, that's, I agree, I think that's very rewarding, but more and more that's harder to do. Yeah, well, there's lots of turnover at the, at the clients. You know, over the years, I mean, HR people, I've worked with some, the same HR person for years, but, you know, others, they, every three or four years, you had, or shorter, you had a new HR person or a new plant manager or a new whatever, and the new general counsel and that stuff, so there's always rotation, and people used to go and stay longer. I mean, I forgot what the statistics show now, but a kid coming out of college today is going to work at four or five different places by the time they're 50 years old. Right, right. I worked at one. <laughs> You worked at one. <laughs> two now. You're two two now. Um, Bill, have we left anything out? It has been a real pleasure, but I want to ask you if there's something else about your career, your life you wanted to mention? Or we no, I don't think so. You know, I don't have any regrets. I mean, I found being a lawyer to be intellectually challenging and rewarding. Uh, I mean, I loved writing briefs. I, mean, I did my own briefs of, of my, whole, my whole career, I, and I, you know, I. I Ms. Lowry taught you how to write. Exactly. Well, you know, actually, Marine Bell didn't like the way Ms. Lowry taught me. <laughs> I had to learn to rewrite your dad. I mean, I had a lot of great professors at Vanderbilt who taught us how to write. But uh, <clears throat> no, it was, uh, you know, I did my own briefs. I would have an associate do one, and then I would, we used red pens to make mistakes, and you know, I'd send it back to them and be red ink all over it. But I told them, don't feel bad. I did the same thing to my own drafts. It's my first draft is just something to scratch on. So I found that enjoyable. I love doing oral arguments, particularly before judges that knew what the case was about and asked intelligent questions. And you know, 
I learned very early doing arguments. But fortunately, most of the time I went to the Sixth Circuit. I was an appellee. I learned pretty early on to sort of read the court and when to sit down and shut up so you didn't step into something accidentally. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much Thank for giving you your time. Enjoyed it. Thanks.